Glory to Jesus Christ. So we're reading the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And this is the second edition, the blue covered second edition, if you're looking for it on Amazon or something. The picture by Liberi Editus Vaticana, that's the Vatican publishing house and bookstore in. And this was published in 2016, 2016. And I just shut the page again that I wanted. Yeah, we're at number 494, 494. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. O Heavenly King, comfort a spirit of truth who are everywhere present and filling all things. Treasure your blessings and giver of life. Come dwell within us and cleanse us also, gracious Lord, Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And uh, if you're not using the paper version, which I almost always prefer, uh, you can get this online at the USCCB site. That's the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops. The United States Catholic Conference of Bishops, yeah. Dot org slash site slash default slash files slash flipbook slash catechism of the Catholic Church or www.vatican.va, Catechism of the Catholic Church, and you can, you know, scroll down to whatever, but you have to get the English on that one. And Catholic Culture offers a PDF drive, a free download ebook of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So this is page 124 in this, in the book, in the paper, the second edition. The green, the blue covered version or red version printing or reprinting. Let it be done to me according to your word, what Mary says to the angel Gabriel when she's offered to uh, be the mother of the Messiah, which she knew would uh, bring difficulties. This virginal conception, who's going to believe this? She's going to have to tell Joseph. You know, Joseph is a devout man and all that, but... So, in fact, Joseph plans to put her away quietly, rather to expose her publicly, to uh, which could result in her being stoned to death. Who knows where par the parents react? Who knows who, who would react to what? So uh, she knew she was potentially going to be killed by saying yes to this. But she does. Let it be done to me according to your word. At the announcement that she would give birth to the Son of the Most High, without knowing man, that is, without sexual intercourse, etc., by the power of the Holy Spirit. This would be its miraculous virginal conception. I was just reading a thing about uh, a, a Central American crocodile in captivity, that a, a female that was... Uh, it had no contact with the male crocodile ever, apparently, and laid eggs, and uh, they, which had, uh, you know, fetal crocodiles in them and all that, but it was a virginal uh, cloning, so to speak, natural cloning. There was some that did, but they say this is the first that they found in a crocodilian. But uh, uh, unfortunately, none of the offspring survived in that. But anyway, this is a real parthenogenesis. This is a, a, a this isn't a natural sort of thing. Uh, it's a, a a divine intervention for that the the virginal conception. So she Mary responding with the obedience of faith, certain that with God nothing will be impossible. Behold. I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. <clears throat> Luke 1, 28, 
through 38. And see Romans 1, 5. Thus, giving her consent to God's word, Mary becomes the mother of Jesus, true God, eternally God, her creator, with the Father and Holy Spirit, but now uh, her procreation in uh, his uh, humanity, in his human body. And, but because she's m not mother of his humanity, merely. M uh, natures do not have mothers, persons do. She's the mother of God, the eternal word incarnate. Espousing the divine will for salvation and wholeheartedly without a single sin to restrain her. <coughs> she gave herself entirely to the person and to the work of her son. She did so in order to serve the mystery of redemption. That is the wonder, the that which surpasses but doesn't contradict reason. Mystery of redemption with him and dependent on him by God's grace. See Lumen Gentium 56 and uh, St. Irenaeus says, this is page 125. As St. Irenaeus says, it's, this is Irenaeus of Lyon in the second century, I think. By being obedient, she became the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. So of course, in one sense, she's, it's, she's not the material cause. Maybe she's the efficient cause or something of like this. But uh, her yes, God uh, wanted her full cooperation, her free cooperation, as he does with us. So uh, I mean, we're in deeper need of, of grace than she was uh, because she was immaculately conceived and never sinned. And um, we can't say the same. But the power of grace is just as powerful for us ultimately so her that yeah, so she hence not a few of the early fathers gladly assert the knot of eve's disobedience was untied by mary's obedience so the old eve now the new eve the old eve of disobedience and rebellion the new eve of obedience and uh, total self-giving With the Virgin Eve bound through her disbelief, Mary loosened by her faith. And that's from the uh, Against the Heresies, uh, 322, 4. And uh, that's in Patrologia Greca 7 slash 1, 959a. Comparing her with Eve, they call Mary mother of the living. So as Eve's name, probably the Sumerian, whatever basis of it, uh, is mother of all the, of the living. So uh, now Mary is the mother of the, uh, the, of the new birth, you know, of the living again, being born again, because it's by Jesus that we're born again, by the power of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the will of the Father. and frequently claim death through Eve, life through Mary. On 43, St. Epiphanius in his, and uh, St. Jerome, I think the latter part was St. Jerome, his uh, uh, Epistle 22 and 21, and that's in Patrologia Latina 22, 408. Epiphanius is a mixed... I think he was uh, uh, rather irritable, I think, but I told this Jerome. But uh, I think Epiphanes of Salamis was the one who ripped up this uh, uh, beautiful tapestry of, that depicted Christ and it because it was, he uh, objected to, to that. So uh, it was fortunate that he was uh, 
put on the list of the saints before iconoclasm, because if it was after, he would be put in the opposite uh, by the Orthodox churches. Okay. Now, Mary's divine motherhood. Called in the Gospels the mother of Jesus, Mary is acclaimed by Elizabeth at the prompting of the Spirit. This is at the visitation in Luke. And even before the birth of her son, as mother of my Lord. That, so uh, the, the fetal John leaps and responds to the fetal Jesus, the fetal Messiah. <coughs> mother of my Lord. from uh, Luke 1, 43. See John 2, 1, John 19, 25, and Matthew 13, 55. She's the mother, mother of the Lord, but mother of my Lord as well. So it has to be this, there really needs to be this personal openness to this. In fact, the one whom she conceived as man by the Holy Spirit, who truly became her son, according to the flesh, was none other than the father's eternal son. Again, the, that analogy. The second person of the Holy Trinity. Hence, the church confesses that Mary is truly mother of God, Theotokos, mother of the word incarnate, mother of God incarnate, the birth giver of God, literally. The uh, I always like... Uh, Archbishop Raya's phrase, the womb of God. Mary was the womb of God. Uh, so, of course, she's not, she's not mother of God the Father. She's not mother, mother of God the Holy Spirit. She's mother of God the Son incarnate. Yet, there's no separation in essence, being, nature, etc., of uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yet, true distinction. And here, the distinction is underlined in a distinction in person. Mary's virginity, 496. From the first formulation of her faith, the church has confessed that Jesus was conceived solely by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, affirming also the corporeal aspect of this event, the bodily aspect of this event. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit without human seed. The Council of Lateran in four. Was that the Council? Of, no, yeah, well, the Council of Lateran, yeah. Council of the Lateran in four forty nine, which is six forty nine rather, six forty nine. Is that the? Is that the first Lateran? Six forty nine. Anyway, so but it's it's not that the councils invent these. Uh, uh, b uh, beliefs, but no, articulate them and defend them and uh, refine them uh, in their articulation. So, the fathers see in the virginal conception the sign that it truly was the son of God who came in a humanity like our own. So that the virginal conception is very important to being a Christian, Orthodox Christian. And that, uh, and, and the enlightenment which did, dismissed all miracles, they said, well, of course, this is, this is just uh, nonsense. But they were also dismissing, dismissing the omnipotence of God in that. And also the intensity of the love that God is for us, that he would plunge himself into our mess, literally, even in taking on the fullness of our nature, taking on our mortal condition, uh, uh, culminating in his death on the cross and vindicated in his resurrection. The fathers see in the virginal conception the sign that it truly was the Son of God who came in a humanity like our own, not just like our own, our own, fully human. Thus, Saint Ignatius of Antioch at the beginning of the second century says, you are firmly convinced about our Lord, who is truly of the race of David, 
according to the flesh, son of God, according to the will and power of God, truly born of a virgin. He was truly nailed to a tree for us in his flesh under Pontius Pilate. He truly suffered as he is also truly risen. So now we, there's, you know, since the so-called enlightenment is often the, uh, the dismissal of, of the divinity of Christ, but that wasn't new because we've seen this, you know, with Islam, see this with others before that, uh, well before it, and even in many ways in, in Arianism in the, uh, there in the fourth century and others. Uh, but often the really early ones, it was the opposite. It was the, the materiality, the humanity, the full humanity of him that was the issue. So, uh, <coughs> in Docetism and, and uh, Christo-Gnostic groups and things. So, but he truly suffered in his humanity. A, a man like us in all things but sin. And that was from St. Ignatius of Antioch to the Smyr, Sir, Smyr, the Smyrna, Smyrnians, Smyrnians, Smyrna. That's the place in Asia Minor. Asia Minor, now Turkey. Uh, one slash dash two apostolic fathers. Uh, that's what it says there. So it also say, uh, see John one thirteen in the prologue of the gospel there. Mm, thunder in the distance. The gospel accounts, and this is page 126. I'm going to sneeze, so get ready, because my sneezes are events. <laughs> there. Excuse me. That woke you up. Okay. Where was I? Yes. Page 126, 497. The gospel accounts understand the virginal conception of Jesus as a divine work that surpasses all human understanding and possibility. See Matthew 1, 18 through 25 and Luke 1, 26 through 38. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, said the angel to Joseph about Mary, his fiancée. In Matthew 1, 20. The church sees here the fulfillment of the divine promise given through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. <coughs> Isaiah 7.14 in the Septuagint, quoted in Matthew 1.23. Septuagint is the Greek, uh, quote, unquote, official translation of that and uh, of the Old Testament. 498, people are sometimes troubled by the silence of St. Mark's gospel in the New Testament epistles about Jesus' virginal conception. Some might wonder if it were merely dealing with legends or theological constructs, not claiming to be history. To this we must respond. Faith in the virginal conception of Jesus met with lively opposition, mockery, or incomprehension of unbelievers, Jews and pagans alike. Yes, St. Paul reminds us of that, <coughs> as does here, or St. Justin in the Dialogues and Origin and Against Chelsus. So it could hardly have been motivated by pagan mythology or by some adaptation to the ideas of the age. So the meaning of this event is accessible only to faith, which understands in it the connection of these mysteries with one another. De Filius uh, from Vatican I, 4. <coughs> Excuse me. In the totality of Christ's mysteries from his incarnation to his Passover, St. Ignatius of Antioch already bears witness to this connection. Mary's virginity and giving birth, and even the Lord's death, escaped the notice of the prince of this world. 
These three mysteries worthy of proclamation were accomplished in God's silence. So uh, the devil who thought he knew everything didn't. And we'll stop there. And uh, let's see if we have time for the uh, commentary from uh, Archbishop Rino Finiscella's uh, a dish compilation there. The Catechism of the Catholic Church with Theological Commentary, <coughs> published in English by our Sunday visitor, Huntington, Indiana, in, uh, was it 2019 that this was put out? Yes, 2019. But before we do that, let's uh, talk about Parthenos or Parthenos, which is, yeah, it has a masculine ending, but it means virgin in Greek. But it can, uh, when it was trans, the translation of Alma, which can mean, <coughs> which maiden, which can mean virgin, but can also just mean young woman, <coughs> from Isaiah, which we cited beforehand. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name will be Emmanuel, God with us. The um, <coughs> and, and some say, oh, well, she was, it's, that's just a young woman. That's all that is. But uh, if that were the case, why there, was there no uh, uproar over translating that into Parthenos, which is virgin? So into the Greek from the Hebrew. So there, but that uh, uh, when that was done before Christ, well before Christ, there was no objection to that. So let's look at this, and this is Uh, this is by, who is it by? Vincenzo Battaglia, and on page 750 in the middle of the page. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, incorporating the guidance of contemporary Mariology, that's the study of Mary, and uh, all Mariology is a comment on Christology, on who Christ is, who Mary is, and uh, and what her role is, and all that, is always a com commentary on Christ, and always has to be based on that, and an an explit a uh, illumination of the Christology rather than an obscuring of it, or a uh, going off from it. So all authentic Marian theology, expect expect all authentic Christian theology, is. Christ-centered and Trinity-directed. So that's true of all, so, so of, uh, you know, devotion to the saints, everything like that, always must be Christ-centered and Trinity-directed. Mariology, which is also the fruit of a prolific harvest of scriptural truths about the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary in salvation history. As the Second Vatican Council taught authoritatively, offers many suggestions for looking to the Virgin Mary as a model of Christian life. It does this by outlining the salient characteristics of the pilgrimage of faith, Lumen Gentium 58, that's <coughs> the light of the nations the, well, about the church, uh, constituted on the church, to, um, in Vatican II. <coughs> and there were those who wanted a separate document on Mary, but the, the the Concilia Fathers said, no, this should be in the context of the church. Mary is in the context of the church, the context of the body of Christ and like, the like. So, <coughs> the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary in salvation history as the Second Vatican Council taught authoritatively, offers many suggestions for looking to the Virgin Mary as a model of Christian life. It does this by outlining the salient characteristics of the pilgrimage of faith. 
which is, a, I think, a beautiful image of the faith life. She led as a mother, a faithful disciple and generous cooperator of her son. And so that we're called to that also. You know, we're not a theotokos, but each one can be a theophoros, a Christ. You can't be a Christ bearer in your womb, but you can be a Christ bearer in your life, a carrier of Christ. And indeed must be if you're authentically a Christian you're in, in, in grace, in the reality of grace. A generous cooperator of her son and a faithful disciple. So we are called uh, to that. A pilgrimage that reached its decisive turning point to the tragic and glorious hour of the passion. When suffering together with her son, in this singular way, she cooperated by her obedience of faith, hope, and burning charity in the work of the Savior in giving back supernatural life to souls. Wherefore, she is our mother in the order of grace. I'll oh, well, finish this paragraph then. That is how we interpret the observation found later in the context of the fourth article of when the Catechism, the fourth article of the Creed, emphasized the Apostles' Creed, emphasizing that Christ wanted to associate his own sacrifice with the people who were in pri its prime beneficiaries, that is, all the members of the church, says that this is achieved supremely in the case of his mother, who was associated more intimately than any other person in the mystery of his redemption, redemptive suffering. 618. Okay, and let's see who's watching. Father Paul Ring, Paul <coughs> Ferugia, <coughs> excuse me, and Amber Van Grant. Hello. Oops. This is slipping away. So Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. So let's pray the Our Father. <coughs> excuse me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bye now. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be.